Amen. Let's pray. Father, in Christ, as we stand in Christ, nothing can stand against us. God, we thank you for this season of Advent. God, as we celebrate your coming, coming into the world, not your creation, because as we've already learned in John, God, you, you've always been. But God, because you loved us, because you cared about us, because you know and knew that this world was hopeless apart from you, God, you brought hope in Christ. You brought not a answer, but the answer for the world. God, I pray today that as we sing a lot of these songs that bring back a lot of memories, maybe even from childhood, God, I pray that this morning that our focus is totally upon you. Thank you for our team, God, that has so faithfully led us today to point our attention, our focus solely on you. Now, God, as we open up your word, God, do what you promised to do. Be faithful, God. Speak to our hearts. We need you. We need you, God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've been here the last several Sundays, about 10 weeks now, we've been in the book of John, actually about 12 weeks. We've been in the book of John. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn back there this morning. John, the second chapter. This morning, we begin to focus in about verse 13. John chapter 2, beginning about verse 13. I, I like to say this quite often. We, we really have nothing significant to say to you apart from God's Word. Um, uh, I'll tell some stories and uh, maybe to try to illustrate a point or to get you thinking in a different direction, but it's really only God's Word that has the power and the authority by the Spirit of God to change your life. And for us to divert from that and to try to uh, pontificate on what we think or what we believe would, could potentially be very damaging in your life. And so we want to be very careful that we don't do that. Sometimes we drift a little bit. Sometimes we're guilty of that. But it's never intentional. And uh, so we hope that you will open up your copy of God's Word. If you don't have one, there should be one right there in the seat in front of you somewhere up and down that row. We kind of have slowly been taking out some of our hymnals and putting more Bibles in. We feel like the Bibles are more important than the hymnals. And so they're there. And uh, reach out there and grab one of those. Or maybe there's someone beside you that's got a Bible. And you can just look on with them, especially if they took a shower this morning and smell nice and those kind of things. We're transitioning. Last week, we dealt with that whole concept of water turned into wine. We dealt with biblical hydration last week. My staff said, no, you didn't. You jumped on about three big social things last week. You probably ran half the church off last week. I didn't know I did that, but they were picking at me. See, there's Jason walks in right on time right there. And, uh, but we, we did walk through the scripture and we tried to address every issue that Christ addressed in that passage. And we did deal with the issue of biblical hydration. But just to remind you, Christ had gone to a wedding to celebrate, to, to affirm God's uh, view of marriage and, and how that God had instituted that. And Jesus went to affirm that, to participate, to celebrate. He went to the big party that was the Jewish wedding, that is the Jewish wedding even today. And uh, when they ran out of wine, it was a big issue. We dealt with that. That and Jesus was engaged in ministry. Jesus provided for them, met their needs, took care of the issue there. And then Jesus in the 13th verse, or excuse me, the 12th verse, the Bible says he and his family go down to Capernaum and they, uh, well, I'm not sure what they did. They spent time together as a family. So there's ministry taking place. There's engagement in people's lives. And then there's time to sort of retreat and rest and spend time with the family. And then the ministry picks back up. I think that's a great pattern for life. You might want to just notice that. I think that's a great pattern for life. And they go away, they withdraw for a little bit, and then they engage right back in ministry. God instituted rest, correct? And if you don't have a day of rest, if you don't have a season of rest, then you're cheating yourself, you're cheating God, and ultimately you're going to crash and burn. That's true for everybody. We, we cannot ignore God's foundational principles and think that we're going to be okay. And so Jesus did that. I mean, we actually see that as we watch his life, as he follows the pattern. And so now the Bible tells us that he heads up to Jerusalem, up because it's above sea level from where they had been. He goes up to Jerusalem, and it's time for the season of Passover. So that sort of brings us forward this morning. So I want you to, get, I want you to write down a couple of things this morning. First thing I want you to write down, it's kind of like Passover. 
Passover or bust. You might want to write that down somewhere. Passover or bust. I, I wish we had gotten a minivan and, and, and written this on the back of it, you know, imposed this on it. But that's where he was. He's headed for Passover. Now, Passover was one of the three major high holy days for the Jewish people. It was very common. It's interesting if you study the New Testament pictures of Passover, specifically if you look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John is the first one. He, well, let me rephrase that. He introduces Jesus going to the Passover earlier than anybody else does, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In fact, you have to go to the end of their writings to find this. Now, does that mean that one of them had it wrong, that maybe John was right and the other three writers were? No. In fact, John gives us several instances where Jesus attends the Passover. So when you begin to debate scripture like that, again, read the whole book. It'll be good for you and the Holy Spirit will jump up on you and change your life forever. Just sort of surprise attack you there, but it'll be good for you and it'll help you understand. So here they are going to this celebration early on, John being inspired by the Holy Spirit to give this particular account. Now again, because it was such a big day, let me talk about that just a little bit. The Passover was such a big deal. In fact, Passover started and the next day they had the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That would go on for a, a week. And so it was a major, major celebration. But the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were connected in several ways. First of all, every male within 20 miles was required to go to this festival in Jerusalem. Now, there are other times where people had to come into the temple and do these same things. But on the... the, the for the Passover and for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, every male within 20, 20 uh, miles was required to be there. Now that made for a massive celebration. I was trying to think of some of the things that we do here, some of the activities that we might see in our city, some big festivals uh, where you just go and there's a mass of people. That's exactly what it would have looked like. It would have been this, this sea of people who were coming from every direction toward Jerusalem for this amazing festival. Every male was required above 20 years of age, was also required to come and pay the temple tax, which would have been a half shekel. That was their monetary system they would use in that day and so they would all save up and be prepared that was about two days wage they would bring that half shekel to the temple and because there could be no emperor image or no image of the emperor let me turn that around inside the temple gates inside the on the temple mount they would have to exchange that money and so there would be a variety of money changers there in the area. Now that was okay. We'll get to the part that's not okay in just a few moments. But think about it. There were people coming from every part of the nation and every part of the land. And so there would be a variety of money that would be brought that would be needed, needed to be exchanged. And also these people were coming to offer up sacrifices. Because of the distance, most of them, you can read this in Jewish history, it's, it's readily available to you. Most of them would have not brought those offerings with us it would have included cattle it would have included sheep it would have included doves and you can just imagine we'll get to that in a moment you can just imagine that atmosphere as well so it was bizarre as it looked like a bizarre it would have been this amazing celebration but things had really gotten out of hand the Passover or bust a high high holy day Think about the travel that would be required. Quite often, families would travel together and they would go up to the celebration, maybe to see other families while they were there or just to participate in this worship event together. So it was an amazing time. But it was not something new. And really, what Jesus experienced here in chapter 2, as we're going to read in a moment, was not new either. In fact, if you look at scripture on the board here on, on the screen from Deuteronomy, I want you to see this and I want us to read along here. He says, three times in a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in a place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths. Remember, the Passover kicked off the unleavened bread. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. So that meant that you would come before him with some sacrifice. Again, that explains why 
why there would have been those animals in the region. So they had prepared for the sacrifice. They prepared for the temple tax. It's once a year. There are psalms that they would actually, psalms, most of them as you know are songs. There were songs that they would literally sing called the psalm of ascents or the song of ascents. And they would sing that as they went up toward Jerusalem. Even as they would approach and begin to climb the steps, there were particular songs that they were to sing at various places. If I were to summarize all this, I would say if you can get all this in your mind, the place was rocking. I mean, it would have been an exciting, vibrant, I mean, a thrilling place to be. All that is okay in a sense. But the problem enters in when we get into verse 14. Let me read verse 13. I'll read into it and you follow along. John chapter 2, verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. That's Passover a bust. We've got that. But now verse 14, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables and he made a scourge of cords. What? ruh -roh. <laughs> And drove them all out of the temple. Now the word temple there is hieron. It's literally temple complex is the purest translation. So it's not some little small area. It's the entire temple complex. Get that picture in your mind. And he, he literally, he poured out the coins of their money changers. He overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. Notice in verse 14, one more time, look what it says. And he found. Why do you think Jesus went to the temple to begin with? Why did you come, why did you come to church today? Well, supposedly we came to worship, right? Without a doubt, Christ would have been going to the temple, to the Passover, and to the, the, the recognition of the Passover, and to the uh, following Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus would have gone there with a heart of worship. He was taking his disciples. They were going because it was the right thing to do, and because Jesus is all about worship. It's bringing the glory to the Father that he so rightly deserves. He wants to participate in that and honor him. He honors this picture of worship. He honors everything about it, again, with his attendance and, and really with the full expectation of doing just that. But what he found was completely different than what he anticipated. Uh, this last Thursday night, I told you last week that our granddaughter has her a birthday this coming Saturday. And so this last Thursday night, we wanted to participate in that and do something and be a part of a celebration for her. So we went to the Pepsi Center. Yes, Bob, I entered in enemy uh, territory. Uh, you know, that's where the, uh, what's that team? Who plays there, the basketball team? The Nuggets, that's it. And Bob, you know they've got this thing in there where you can actually stand behind the Nugget uniform with the arms and the big tall. Have you seen that? And take your picture? I almost did that, but I thought it would be blasphemy, so I didn't. I, the, the Thunder people would have come after me, so I didn't do that. If you don't know, I'm an Oklahoma City Thunder fan. Bob's a Nugget fan. We have fun, a little banter there going back and forth. Um, and, and so we went to the thing, and they had Disney on ice. Oh yeah, ooh, ah, uh, see, so some of you know about that, right? So Inslee is pumped. We met here at the church. They all got in our vehicle. We drove down there and parked, and, and, and she's just excited. She's got on her princess dress, and she's got her magic wand. You know, the light comes on and spins around. I don't know if you've seen all that stuff. You don't have a daughter if you haven't. But anyway, um, so we're, we're just all excited. And I, I get down there, and I think, uh, now as we're driving in, and Josh and Tori are pretty good about this stuff, but they always, oh, oh, do you guys have any cash? And Sherry knows that I have money. She gives me that $20 a month, you know, and I put it in my pocket. So she knows when I've got my, my $20. And so she always asks me for money. And I think she told Tori and Josh that I had money. So you got any cash? Sure. So we get there and I have to park. They charge you 10 bucks to park in that place, right? I'm thinking, you're already getting a million dollars for this event. Why are you charging to park on top of it? But, you know, because they've got all those fees in the tickets. You ever paid attention to that? 
Uh, you're not going with me at all on this. You, you folks need to get out and do some stuff every once in a while. You'd find this out. Well, anyway, they, they start charging. So we get in. We, we pay the parking. It's fine. We get to actually park up kind of close because we're there early. And, and then we begin to go in the building. And I mean, it's just this herd of princesses. I mean, everywhere you look, there's princesses. I mean, everywhere. They're just everywhere. I thought, I didn't know there were this many. They're just everywhere coming out of the cars and stuff. So we get in and we go through the door and show them our tickets. And we, we get on in. And, 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 and we start going up. And all of a sudden over here, there's a kiosk. And they're selling magic wands and they're selling pixie dust and they're selling snowballs princess snowballs and then over here they're selling dresses and princess t-shirts and then you go up another 20 feet and they've got another kiosk and they're selling all this stuff and literally they're just people all over you and they're whole walking around you know how they normally have things at sporting events and stuff with popcorn and, and maybe cotton candy on it and they're cotton candy or whatever well, they, they've got pixie dust and princesses wands and all and they're like just hawking you and they're all over you and it's like get off of me get behind me Satan in the name of Jesus but it, it's just crazy and then you look at the prices and Sherry and I didn't have time to eat we had a very busy week and so she said we'll just grab a hot dog oh man if you don't know hot dogs are not my favorite thing I, I generally when I go to a baseball game I'll eat one just for the principle of it but I, I try to avoid them if I eat two a year I, that's, that's like way over my limit so okay so we, we go up to the concession stand. We get our seats and we go back to the concession stand. And she said, what do you want? I said, hot dog's fine. You know, we'll just do the, the event food. And so we got two hot dogs and we got a, a thing of popcorn. And, and I said, let's just share a drink. It's a lot cheaper because Inslee wanted the popcorn. That's the reason we bought that. And so I said, let's share a drink. And so she got the drink and I'm standing there with the money. And the guy goes, that'd be $28. <laughs> you can buy a hundred hot dogs for $28. I mean... Maybe a thousand. It should be a thousand, you know, for what's in them. So I paid. I'm going, man, this is a ripoff. This is a racket, you know. Are, are you tracking with me? So I went, and we had a great time. You know, just sitting there beside Inslee and watching her little face. She knew every character that came out. I mean, she could name them. And they were doing a birthday celebration, and they were saying, well, we don't have anybody that has a birthday. And Inslee was going. <laughs> and she's raising her hand. It, just, it was classic. We were having a great time. But what I found, <laughs> with all that other stuff, you know, they got you. I mean, they have you. They know that you're there. They know that you're going to have a little princess with you. And they know whatever a little princess wants, a little princess gets, right? <laughs> it's kind of the way it was when Jesus got to the temple. Think about it. It's kind of that way. It was not a bad thing. There were some good things about it. But it was totally twisted. Now, now listen very carefully because there's application for us today that we're going to think about as we walk this. What he found was not worship. It was not the Passover and the festival or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But what he found was a place of business. A place of business. And we got Passover bus, write down this, place of business. He did not experience the worship that he desired. Now, I... Theologically, you know, we could debate this and Christ being God and worship and all ways and glory and all that. I understand that. But remember, he was going to affirm the practice, the, rem the reminder. And remember, Passover was significantly powerful because it represented the exit, God literally leading them to exit out of the slavery of Egypt. And it's a picture of where we are today, slaves to our sin, literally trapped by our sin. And without intervention of God, we have no hope. But remember because of the blood in the Old Testament that they put around the doorpost, they were spared, they were set free, and ultimately they were led out of that slavery. And, and we celebrate that, we think about that. For us, it, it represents the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made, right? Because we're enslaved to our sin, we're dead, we're separated from God. But Christ paid the ultimate price for us. And so we continue in a sense that same celebration every time we gather as the New Testament church, as the people of God and those who are our guests in this room. That's what we're all about. It's all about the Christ and what he's done. But do you find that true authentic worship or do you often find the business of even church? Now, you know as well as I do, there's so much that we do in the church that you cannot find in the Bible. We have this tension of doing everything in decency and order and, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 
So we try to strike that balance. Do we have the perfect formula? No, no church does. No church ever will on this side of heaven. But we seek to do the best that we can. But I do think it's important that we examine everything that we do and say, biblically, is this in line with our mission? Does this line up with what our purpose is? And when Jesus walked in here and he saw this place of business, I really believe he was shocked. And some have said he was angry. Well, I suppose if you put together a whip and you drive people out, there's probably a little passion engaged. Whether it was anger or not, I'm not really sure. It's kind of interesting because John is not known as the detail guy, but now twice, the first part of chapter 2, and now where we are today, John gives us more detail than the other gospel writers do. Kind of ironic when you think about it. John's painting the big picture, wants us to believe. You remember that's his purpose based on what we find in chapter 20. And so now he begins to paint this detail. Think with me a moment about the temple structure. Some of you have studied this before, and so I'll be very brief. Some of you have not. But the temple was designed, and it was kind of a pecking order, if you will. Now, sorry, I didn't set this up. It's just the way it was, okay? But let me describe it to you. You literally would come up those, those, those temple steps that would ascend right into the temple mount. Again, if you ever get the chance to go, it's an amazing place. Even today, though, those who do not recognize our Christ kind of have control of that. Uh, That one day will change according to Scripture. But right now, they kind of have control of that area. And you can literally walk up some of those old steps. You can get close to that even to today. There was a time when you could actually go into the Temple Mount. We had the privilege of doing that in recent past. Uh, But you can't really do that anymore. But they would walk in, and the first area of the Temple Mount there, the outside court, would be what's known as the Court of the Gentiles. Now, ultimately, that's all the people who were not Jewish people. That's all the people who were not immediately God's chosen people. Understand how I say that. So there was the area of the Gentiles. And then you would move on a little further, and there would be the the court of women. Now, women had a little better spot than the Gentiles did. You'd move on just a little bit further, and there was the court of the Israelites, or the Jewish people, then the priest. You'd move on in, and there would be what would be called the Holy of Holies. And that was that special place where only the high priest could go and then only one day a year. Now get that image in your mind and go back to the bazaar that I described to you a little bit earlier. This is really important. Don't miss this. So what would happen is all these vendors, all these hawkers would get there. Now again, historians record this for us in explicit detail. And what they would do is they would try to get the first places as people would enter into the temple. Why? Well, I get there first. If I connect with you first, you're going to buy from me. Now, the people who were exchanging the money, by the way, they didn't do it just as a community service. They would always charge. And they would charge, in fact, exorbitant prices for the exchanging of the money. And so here they would come and they would, they would seek to be the first in line. No, they, they try to get their place. Now, we're not talking about a table set up with an ATM for people who didn't bring their tithe that Sunday. That's not what we're talking about. Get the picture of a bazaar. People literally competing for all these resources. You'd see people set up with with tables and and booths and they would have uh, those baskets with doves in them they would sell you for a sacrifice or some other, or for our sheep or whatever the animal was. Get those smells and those sights and that experience in your mind. And they would fight for those outside places so they could be the first one in line to be able to make profit. Now, where was that first wave? What did I say? What's the first group? Do you remember? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. The Gentiles who desperately needed to know God. They were providing a service which seemed somewhat viable. Now, again, the charging, the extra prices, the selling, all those sort of things. No, But it did serve a purpose, and so there could be some justification, but Christ saw deeper into it. Stay with me on this. When Jesus arrived, he saw those animals, the kiosks, the tables, the money, again, all throughout the temple complex. Matthew tells us that Jesus said, my house should be a house of prayer, and there wasn't much prayer going on. In fact, he goes on to say that Christ said, you've turned it into a den of thieves and robbers. 
Now, seeing that picture in your mind, you understand why he would have made that statement. Now, if they were not allowed to come anywhere other than the Gentiles, anywhere other than that court of Gentiles, and it was predominantly filled with all these vendors, with people satisfying their own desires, meeting their own needs, doing what suited and was best for them. If, if that's what it had all become, then how would these people ever hear about the one true God? Uh-oh, some of you are starting to figure out where I'm going here, aren't you? Hmm. The merchants, in effect, torpedoed any opportunity for a person who did not know God to get to know God in the Old Testament system and structure. Do you see that? Literally have taken over. Now, they would not have been able, they would have not allowed to set up, be set up in the Holy of Holies. And I'm not really sure how far, there's some debate about how far out, whether they even were in the court of women. But for sure we know that they were in this court of Gentiles. And that so broke the heart of the very purpose of temple worship. In fact, if you go back to 1 Kings, we spent some time there this summer. In fact, we were in a series this summer and we dealt with this. If you go back to 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 41. In fact, I think we've got those verses on the screen as well. Look up here as I read. Also concerning the foreigner, that's the non Jewish person, the person who is not in that covenant relationship with God, that person who does not know God. We, we take it to where we are today, the person who does not know Christ in a personal relationship. They might be religious, but they don't know Christ. They've not been changed by Christ. That's how we would apply that today. Uh, concerning the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, when he comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand of your outstretched arm. When, I lost my place there. And when he comes and prays toward this house, here in heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may what? Know you. See, that's always been what the house of worship is about. Yes, to worship, to glorify God with our praise, with our actions, yes. But it's been to be a public witness to the world that our God saves. That's what we're supposed to be about, folks. The missional foundation of who we are is to do everything Everything in light of his calling to us with a heart of obedience. To say, God, how can we better accomplish what you've called us to do? That the earth may know your name to fear you as do your people Israel. And that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. So from the very beginning of the construction of the temple, that was part of the purpose. And now they had overtaken the temple and they had made it something for their benefit. Wow. Now, in case you're just sitting there thinking, man, this doesn't apply to me. Huh. Why did I come today? I wish those people would quit doing that. Let's quit doing all that stuff. Let's, sell, let's get rid of everything in here that looks like business and, and let's move on with it. Well, it's not quite that easy. Here, here's a question I want you to ponder. I think I've got it on the screen as well. Am I doing anything? Look at this. Write this question down. Am I doing anything that prevents or discourages people from worship? Would you be honest enough to answer that question? Am I doing anything that prevents or discourages people from worship? You know, last Sunday we had the opportunity to baptize Grace. I had the opportunity to do that and Julia had invited her and I, I just thought, you know, that's a beautiful picture of how it's supposed to work. It's not that the hired guns on the church staff go out and reach all the people for Christ. 
But it's that the body of Christ, with their attitude, with their love of Christ, they're going out and they're saying, man, my God is amazing. He's doing some really amazing things in our little fellowship known as Riverside. I want to invite you to come. I want you to see our, I want you to hear our God. You know what? We're not perfect. We've got some messes that we continually work on and we're trying to improve, but we really do love Jesus and I would just love for you to come and hear about him. And, and if, you know, that's the attitude and the heart that we should have putting aside everything else and by the way when we do that it works that'd be a great time for somebody to say amen right there when we do that it works yeah it does it does but again that question am I will you own this question I mean, does that make you mad to even consider that question? Am I doing anything that prevents or discourages people from worship? That is, in context, at least part of what was taking place. John chapter 2 in these verses. Second question is this. I hope you'll write this one down and think about it. Have I made the worship event something that benefits me more than pleasing the Lord? Have I made the worship event something that benefits me more than pleasing the Lord? And in context, that's exactly what was taking place again. Many other things, you can't exhaust this passage, there's tons of application, but these things are absolutely true, and I believe at the heart of what Jesus was dealing with. Again, in the other accounts, he says that it's a house of prayer and he taught there and he, he ministered to the hurting people there and his point was is that it, it should always be a place where people could come and connect with God and that prayer would become a priority. Do you ever notice in church, not, let me just tell you, you don't, you're not in the worship planning meetings, but can I tell you, uh, in all my years of ministry, quite often, you know what prayer is? Prayer is a transition in worship it's how you get from one song to another song or it's how you get from a welcome to a song or it's how you get from a song to a sermon often we plan those things not to really cry out to God and isn't it amazing because really prayer is about God and God alone it's communication with him it's not about hey this be a good time to have a prayer <laughs> And I would say that prayer is something that we do without ceasing. It's not just when you stand up and you have a 30 seconds allotted in a program and you say, pray. Not sure that really is biblical prayer if it's with that intention. My house shall be a place of prayer that it would be a priority. We're going down to verse 17. We've got two more points. We're finished. These will go a lot faster. His disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. That, and the Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us your authority for doing these things? Now, if I were Jesus, I'd have held up that whip and I'd have said, this is my authority, you know? And you guys, you get that, don't you? The ladies don't get that. But the guys, don't you get that? You guys get it? Say, we get it. That's what I'd have done. I'd have held the whip up and said, you want my authority? Here's my authority. Come on, bring it. But Jesus didn't do that. Although he did use that and used it with authority, Jesus answered them. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What? 46 years to build this thing? You're going, what? The Jews said, it took 46 years to build the temple and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. Wow. Many believed in his name. Observing his signs, which he was doing. But look at this, don't miss this. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Let me remind you, Jesus knows what's in you. He knows what's in me. He knows what's in us. He knows every conversation. He knows the intent, the motive of our heart, whether it's pure or whether it's tainted. He knows us. You can't fake out Jesus, right? 
right? Okay. So two things. I said two points and I'd be finished. Then there's the picture of his body. He, he sort of gives us this image here. And, and he says literally, he says, I, you, you tear this thing down, I, I'll, I'll, I'll restore it in three days. Now, we know because we have the luxury of looking back at Scripture that he was talking about his death on the cross. He was talking about being raised from the dead after the third day. We get that image. But I think there's something else going on here. Of course, they didn't get it. They totally missed it. They thought he was talking about reconstructing the temple and tearing it down. And this guy's a nut was kind of their approach to it. But I picked up on something here. Simply cleansing the temple was never the goal of Jesus in all of this. Frankly, you think about it because if that really was his goal, we wouldn't be able to relate today. This would, we'd be like going, what is that all about? I don't, what, what is that? Temple? What, what, I don't get that. Old Testament. What are we talking about here? Restoring the temple really was not his goal. It, it was just days before the Passover. And as a part of Passover and unleavened bread, every house had to be meticulously cleansed of any leaven. And they had put in the effort to remove every little fragment, little flake of leaven in their households, but no one cared about God's house being full of leaven. Did you get that? meticulously concerned about their own lives and making sure they had it right, but no one cared about the leaven in God's house. And Jesus is using this image of his body, the money changers, all this graph that's going on in the temple is a picture of the leaven that was literally eating away at the very soul of God's people. Now, could it be today that we're kind of like that? We're, we're looking out and we're looking elsewhere, but there's leaven in God's house. Oh, remember, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwells in you and while we're looking and trying to find fault and, and things that ought to improve on, how often do we fall before the cross and say, God, would you show me in my body, in my life, in my mind, in my heart, God, the leaven that offends you? It's great to take that inventory very often. And then look at the priority of believing. The priority of believing. We read those verses and he talked about how he said many believe because of the signs, but Jesus did not believe in them. The root word here is always the word pistuo, which is a, it means to trust in, to rely upon completely. You know, I've used the, the picture, you've seen it probably most of your spiritual existence where someone has a stool or a chair and you say, I, I believe that will hold me. I believe it will, 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 will stand up under my body weight. And, but you can say you believe, but that's not belief as is the word is used here in the Bible. It only becomes belief when you actually sit on it and allow it to sustain your weight. And so we can say mentally, I believe in Christ, but we are not a child of the King until we throw all that we have upon Him and we rely and we trust totally on Him. And Jesus knew that there were many there who were going ooh and ah over the coolness of what was taking place, but they didn't truly believe. What's the difference? Well... It's not enough to be incensed. I should have put this on the screen because you really need to write this down. It's not enough to be incensed over what is wrong, but to be willing to do what is right. Can I say it again? Oh, that I could get that message out to the news outlets today all over the United States. It's not enough to be incensed over what's wrong. That's not really believing. That's not really truth. But are you willing to do what's right over what's wrong? 
If I could say that to our world today and have them read Galatians 5, I think they'd have every answer they need. Works of the flesh, fruit of the Spirit. That's our problem. We're living out works of the flesh, not living in the fruit of the Spirit. And only Christ can make that change. Does anybody in this room agree with that? Thought there might be a couple of you. So Jesus had a great love. He has a great love for those who were not yet there. And that's why he's incensed over this court of Gentiles being taken over and this place not being the house of prayer. And again, you can say, man, that's right. We ought to pray more. Well, great. Next week at 830, show up for claiming our campus for Christ. And let's pray all over this campus. We do it every Sunday morning. One amen. You see, we can say we need to do this and we've got all these problems and we need to change this and our church is a mess and we need to do it. We can say all that. But why don't we come and pray? Why don't we claim our campus for Christ? Oh, I I know the arguments. I'm not trying to say that's the only time you're spiritual. But I do think it's important to remember that the last thing that Jesus did before he went to the cross to die was to call his people to pray. And when he came back to check on them, you know what they were doing? They were sleeping. They couldn't get out of bed. Okay, I took a lot of liberty with the text right there, didn't I? (laughs) But think about it, folks. You want to see a great move of God? We need to not just be incensed over what's not. We need to be passionate enough to do something about it. And here he points out very clearly that prayer was the key. His love for those who are outcasts often required judgment and a strong rebuke against their oppressors. And this time, in this text, God's own people were the oppressors of those who did not yet know him. Could it be, if we answered those two questions I gave you a few moments ago, honestly, could it be that sometimes we actually become oppressors to those who don't yet know him? Here's what I want to challenge you to do. The next two weeks, coming weeks, will be in John chapter 3. We're going to look at Nicodemus, and then I'm going to share a message the following week. I'm just calling it Merry Christmas, John chapter 3, verse 16. But we're going to start with Nicodemus next Sunday. Here's an opportunity for you to invite people who will hear the gospel, and it's all up to the Holy Spirit But if he chooses to speak into their hearts and they choose to respond to his overture of love, listen, listen, it could be that over the next couple of weeks we could see many come to faith in Christ. And may I say to you, it's not my call and it's not your call. It is simply upon me to invite them in obedience to the Scripture and to share the truth of God's word and to show them where hope is and to give God opportunity in their lives at that moment under the authority of the scriptures to bring them to Christ. Will you invest into the court of Gentiles in the next couple of weeks? Will you invite everybody you know? Will you be a part of the solution, not just propagating the problems? The Passover or bust. That's what I'm looking for. Let's celebrate the blood that set me free from the slavery of sin. God, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you are speaking to hearts. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would shut the mouth of the devil even at this moment. God, as he causes confusion... He causes us to focus on everything and anything other than the cause of Christ. And God, if this Christmas season is about anything, surely it is about the good news of the coming of the Soder, the Savior, King Jesus. God, use us today. God, help us not to experience the whip of Christ, but the grace of the cross. God, help us to be people that will be a part of your missional call to the kingdom. God, part of that is with what we give. Part of that is 
with what we do and what we say. God, we expect great things in the coming days. And we thank you, God, that ultimately it all depends on you. Not my failure, not my weakness, and not any ability that I think I have. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? The altar is open this morning. If you'd like to come and pray, there'll be ministers right here. As we sing together, I encourage you to respond to God. So let's sing, and you come even now.